I'm gonna title this message fight with fire fight with fire I believe the Lord wants to release a grace today to deliver people but most importantly he wants to empower people to fight back I think too many people have been dependent on somebody else to deliver them and too little people have depended on the Holy Spirit and the weapons of our warfare which are mighty in God to loose themselves from chains and bondages. Amen. If you have your Bible let's go together with me to book of Acts chapter 28 and verse 1. Now when they had escaped they found out that the island was called Malta and the natives showed us unusual kindness for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. And we will skip all that what the naysayers were saying in verse 5. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. And if you read a little bit later, you will see that in that region, verse 8, that Paul went into him and prayed and laid his hands. Remember what the viper was attacking, the hands of Paul. Paul laid his hands on him and healed him. Lord, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, and I am grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to stand in a group of people that love you, that have a vision, and that have a purpose for the miracles that this house represents. Bless your word today and let it change people's lives in Jesus' name. Amen. I, wanna, I have three points. So I'm just going to share. I'm a pastor and also a little bit teacher. So I'm just going to share with you and we're going to have some notes in the back that you can take with you as well. Before there was fire, I want you to notice is there was a storm, there was a shipwreck, and there was a rain. Before Paul built fire on this island that he landed, island of Malta, the Bible says that Paul was a prisoner and he suffered a shipwreck and he endured a storm and in the time that he was building fire, it was raining, which is not the best place or environment for building fire. If you're taking notes, write this down. You will burn for God to the degree that you will overcome excuses. You will be on fire for God to the degree that you will come overcome excuses. And I'm going to give you your three best excuses that the devil will use. It will be a storm, a shipwreck, and the rain. A storm, it's when you ask God to do something for you and He doesn't seem to answer your prayer. A storm that came into my life is I was born in a particular way. If you noticed already, if you looked at the screen, one of my eyes doesn't look like the other one. It's a factory defect. Like they like to say, I was born this way. I struggled as a teenager because of my physical appearance. I struggled with burning for God. I struggled with being on fire for God because how can I burn for God that I felt like burned me? And that was my storm. Some people's passion for God is quenched because of a disappointment, unanswered prayer. Why did God allow this to happen? Why did He deliver me from this thing? But what I want to encourage you with this, today is that there are some battles God delivers you from and there are some battles He delivers you through. Some fires He keeps you from and some fires He walks with you through. Christian faith is not a bridge over troubled waters. Sometimes Christian faith is the path right through them. Because our Savior walks on water. And what happened with me is though God didn't heal the cosmetics of my face, He healed my heart and I had to learn to step over the unanswered prayer, unexplained mysteries. I don't know why this person died. I don't know why God didn't answer that prayer. But I know one thing, if you listen to the lie of the enemy, He will kill your fire. The devil walks around with the fire extinguisher and one of them is an offense against God. 
And every person, sooner or later, every man of God has a prayer God didn't answer. Every person who is used by God has an area in their life they're still believing in God for. None of us have our life perfect. None of us live our life for we don't need to live in faith. Maybe your excuse is not a storm. Maybe your excuse is a shipwreck. And the reason you're not burning for God is because the ship that's supposed to take you from point A to point B and it's a ship that God blessed you with and you testified in your small group how God provided for that ship but now you got laid off. But now the company laid off its workers but now that business hit a bankruptcy. Now that which used to provide for you manna seized. The dry brook used to be a blessing and now it became a place of struggle and a burden. It's the things that are supposed to carry us fall from under our feet. And when people experience that they lose their fire and they develop excuses and they say things like, I can't trust in God anymore. I can't give anymore. I can't burn for God anymore. But I want to remind you that sometimes when God removes one thing, it's because He's preparing to bring something better. God did not remove manna to punish Israel. He removed manna because He never promised manna. He promised milk and honey. Manna was just a temporary provision. Milk and honey was they where they were headed. But God couldn't take them to milk and honey until He took manna off of the menu. So don't blame God when He removes manna. Prepare yourself for milk and honey. Prepare yourself for God's prosperity when God's provision fails. A lot of us experience God's provision. But God's provision has to stop for God's prosperity to start. And between those seasons is where many of us get confused. We get, we, we lose our passion, we, we get confused, we, we, st we start getting nervous and I want to challenge you today, don't yield to those excuses. But I believe the greatest excuse that Christians face that quenches their flame for God is the rain. The rain, if you think logically, kills fire. If it's raining, you can't have fire. It will extinguish it. The rain, what I mean is our personal, private battles and our flesh issues, our weaknesses, things we keep falling into, repeated cycles, habits we are still trying to conquer, things we repent from and keep doing. Some of those things have demons behind them. Some of those things need counseling. Some of those things need discipleship. But one thing that the devil wants to do is he wants to use the rain in your life right now to give you a false idea that if you stop the rain, then you should build a fire. But what I loved Paul for is that Paul built fire when it was raining. The Bible says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But did you know how I used to read that verse? Don't fulfill the lust of the flesh so you can walk in the Spirit. Meaning, get yourself washed before you take a shower. How many of you take a shower before you take a shower? How many of you wash your hands before you wash your hands? The devil lies to us and says, break the addiction first and then start fasting. Break the habit first and then commit to a small group. The devil lies to us and he says, quit this first and then start tithing. Meaning get rid of the rain and then build the fire. But you must understand is that you will never be able to get rid of the rain until you build fire. Somebody touch your neighbor and say build fire. Touch your other neighbor that was not your first preference and say even if it's raining. Build fire even if it's raining. Build fire even if you're addicted. Come to church even if you're struggling.
Come to church even if you're doubting. Come to church even if you're hurting. Come to church even if you're offended. Come to church even if you are grieving. Come to church even if you are broke. Come to church even if you are stink. Come to church even if you are high. Because once you meet the Most High, you will be high no more. Come to church. Somebody shout, build fire. I can hear you. Somebody shout, build fire. The Bible says, this kind does not leave except by prayer and fasting. There are certain rains in your life, they will not stop until you start building fire. Oh, it will be hard to fight the guilt and the condemnation when you build fire because the devil will say, you're too dirty to read the Bible. Your mind is too perverted to fast. You're too screwed up to begin to go to the altar and receive prayer. Get your life cleaned up first. But you gotta rebuke that devil and say, the only way, the only way I get clean is if I touch Jesus Christ. A dirty woman touched the feet of Jesus and she was made whole. The same way goes for you and goes for me. Can somebody say amen? amen. So number one, we can't burn for God until we overcome excuses. The devil will find excuse that's most susceptible for you. People who are on fire for God are not special. They're just better at overcoming excuses than you are. That's all. You don't have to have all your life spent on drugs to burn on fire. All you gotta do is beat excuses. Now some of you, your excuse is the blankets. You lose the battle with the blankets every day. And those blankets have principalities sitting on them. They're warm during the night, but it becomes warfare during the morning. And that's your excuse. But today you're going to be an overcomer. Not only over demons, but also over excuses. Can somebody say, build fire. The second thing that I want to highlight, and that is this. And this is the verse that I want to reread, verse 2. The natives showed us unusual kindness. I want you to look at this phrase. For they kindled, somebody say kindled, a fire. But I want you to notice that verse 3 says, But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, somebody say bundle of sticks. Write this down in your notes. Someone will always kindle your fire. Only your bundle of sticks keeps it burning. Let me say that again. God will use a conference to kindle it. But only your choices keep it. God will use a summer camp to kindle it. But it does not keep on burning because somebody kindled it. You have to find your own dry sticks. There's every, I believe almost, unless you're not saved yet, you're coming tonight for the first time and you will encounter God. But if you ever experienced moments where you got on fire for God at the camp, when you got saved, when you got baptized in the Holy Spirit, when you got, when you got delivered at the altar, and you experience this, this thing where the natives, I call them natives, it could be pastor, apostle, teacher, a ministry altar leader, a small group leader, somebody that sparked it, kindled it, and man, you were burning for God for 72 hours and after 72 hours the emotions they fade after 72 hours the glory seems to fade away angels kind of fly away demons come in and you're like man I'm back to my old life I'm not destined to live on fire for God I'm not destined to live sold out for Jesus you know what I'm just a messed up where is the next conference when is the next summer camp? Where is the next fix? Where is that preacher going next? Why? Because I need another fix. I need another kindling. Well, I came here today to disappoint you. You don't need another kindling. You just need to roll up your sleeves and find yourself some dry sticks. An encounter with God 
will not change your life if you don't change your way. Let me say that again. An encounter with God will not change your life if you don't change your friends. If you don't change your what you watch, what you read. An encounter with God sparks a change but it cannot sustain a change because a sustained revival requires dry sticks. But many of us, we are addicted to the ministry at the church. We are addicted to the ministry of a man of God. We are addicted to a conference. We are addicted to a hype. We live not from glory to glory, but from a conference to a conference. We don't go from faith to faith. We go from a preacher to a preacher. God called the ministers to kindle, but He has anointed you to gather. The tale of two souls in the Bible. One soul went to Ramah to kill David, has an encounter. One Saul goes to Damascus to persecute Christians, has an encounter. One Saul goes to Ramah, ends up under the power of God so powerfully, the heat is overwhelming. He takes his clothes off and goes naked. Pretty crazy encounter. I pray to God this doesn't happen to any of you today. The other Saul has a more dramatic encounter. He goes blind, falls on his face. Incredible, crazy experience. One Saul gets up from that experience, feels relieved and does exactly the same thing and becomes an apostate. The other Saul gets up, prays, fasts, water baptism, changes his friends, starts preaching and becomes an apostle. Both had encounters. One was an apostate the other became an apostle. An encounter does not change you. An encounter sparks a change, but you have to add sticks to it. Are you with me? Somebody say build fire. I'm going to present to you three sticks. So with excuses, I gave you three excuses. Storm, shipwreck and rain. Three sticks. The first stick is prayer. Now, the reason why I'm going to give you these three sticks is because you and I have three main temptations of the flesh. Lust, pride and greed. Prayer defeats pride. I'm going to say something, it might offend some of you. The real reason you don't pray is not because you're busy, you're proud. Pride is the real reason. Why? Because if your child has a car accident, your business goes out of the window. Business isn't the problem. The problem is that you think you can do it without God. Prayer. Prayer is a cry. Prayer is a conversation. But a lot of times before prayer becomes a delight, it has to be a discipline. I want to encourage each and every one of you to establish a dry stick. And that's why it's dry sometimes. So many people love to pray when it's wet. Learn to pray when it's dry. Learn to pray when you don't feel it because it's not about feeling. It's about God enjoying your presence in prayer as much as you enjoying God's presence in prayer. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Has it ever occurred to you that prayer is not just about you experiencing God, it's about God experiencing you. God loves you. You are His child. You are His bride. He wants to see your presence in His presence. I remember pastor one time I was struggling in my prayer and I would, I would come in, I, would, I wake up, I tried to wake up very early to go to prayer and I just wouldn't feel anything. In fact, I felt worse after prayer. I just hated to admit it until one day I told God, I said, Lord, it probably be better if I get just good sleep. I feel better. You feel better. Everybody feel better. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak and He said, you come here for me. I invite you 
for you. He says, I want your presence more than you ever will feel the need for mine. He says, do you have scars on your hands to prove that you died for me because you wanted to have me? He says, I have scars to prove that I wanted your presence. I wanted you to be with me. Man, that changed my, my prayer life. So instead of going in to try to connect my frequency, to find that right wave, right song, I came next day. I sat down there and I said, God, here I am. Enjoy me. And I just shut up and I just sat there three, four minutes and the love of God started to flood my heart in such a way and I started to recognize prayer isn't about me. That means what I feel is secondary. What he experiences is first. Did he feel loved? Did he felt worshipped? That is more important than that I feel his presence. Take eyes off of yourself in prayer because he already gave his life. Come to honor him. For those of you who don't live a life of prayer, I always tell people if you don't pray, you stray. Jesus changed Peter's name from Simon to Peter. Peter means rock, Simon means unstable, shaky, wobbly, like a reed. Never called him Simon until at the garden. Simon, Simon, Satan sifted you, wanted to sift you. Why? Because Peter was about to walk in the garden and sleep when he's supposed to be praying. And this is the lesson. When your prayer life goes to sleep, your past gets resurrected. Your old you comes back from the dead. The you that you got delivered from, can I tell you something? It's lying in the tomb waiting for your prayerlessness to wake it up. Prayerlessness resurrects all demons. Prayerlessness resurrects all habits. So I want to challenge you, if you want to burn for God, listen, set up the alarm, set up the coffee, go to sleep early, whatever you need to do. Win the battle with the blankets, but get yourself up. Bring yourself to the secret place and call on God in the secret place. Pray to Him, worship Him, read the Word. Why? Because you cannot stay on fire if you don't have a dry stick. Way less amens. I love it. The second stick is fasting. Fasting. If you want to last, you got to fast fasting. Now we don't like fasting but God created you to fast. The reason why is because when you eat your first meal in the morning it's called break fast. So your body's already been fasting eight hours but it's not a choice that your body chose. It's pretty much by sleeping. You were created to fast. What fasting does to us is this, is it conquers lust. If prayer conquers pride, fasting conquers our appetites. Fasting is not when you are trying to do your blood work and you don't eat for the morning. Fasting is when you choose to do it for spiritual reasons, abstaining from food. Turning off your Instagram is not fasting. I know it's cute, it's American, it's not fasting. The reason why it's food, humanity's first temptation was with food. Jesus' first temptation was with food. Israel's temptation in the wilderness after getting out of Egypt was food. Food is gonna be your one of the biggest temptations. Why? Because you have another king that's growing in his throne called King Stomach. And for some of you, this king is so highly exalted you can't see your toes. I'm not making this up. The Bible says in the New Testament, some people's God is their belly. And I know we don't drink, we don't sleep around, but a lot of us have made a fridge into an idol. Because we eat emotionally. That's why fasting is scary. Because you will not know what to do with toxic emotions. Instead of going to the comfort called the Holy Spirit, we go to a taco. We all need regular times of fasting. Why? Because it disrupts our idols. It disrupts our mechanism of coping with toxic emotions. And instead of running to the fridge, we run to the Holy Spirit. 
Food is not your friend. You're supposed to have real friends and those friends cannot live in the fridge. Those friends should walk on both legs and have both arms. Those friends are not those they get eaten and swallowed in. If you want to burn on fire for God, you have to develop a habitual life of fasting. Jesus did not say, if my people will fast, when they fast. Early church for hundreds of years fasted two days every week. Two days every week. Today, some churches and some Christians will fast two days in a lifetime. And we're like, they walked in the power. Listen, your fire needs fuel. You can't burn if there is no fuel. If you want to get your hunger back, very simple too. Go physically hungry for 72 hours with the purpose to see God. I promise you. If not during the fasting, after the fast, you will come back like Jesus with power. If Jesus fasted and He was the Son of God, you should fast if you're a son and daughter of God. You should fast if you want to live on fire for God. I want to challenge you to fast. This is not a sermon that you take notes like, yeah, amazing, praise God. If you don't put it to practice, it doesn't work. I wrote a book called Fast Forward and once a month, I lead a team of some, I think it's up to 20,000 people now that fast three days every month. And I fast with them and we have live streams and all of that stuff. And one of the reasons is because I do believe that God wants to restore a version of Christianity that's not carnal but crucified. American mainland Christianity is a carnal Christianity. It's sort of like new age. It's all about self-discovery. Biblical Christianity is about self-denial and it's about crucifixion. It's about carrying your cross. It is not about you, it is about Him. And fasting is one of the best ways where you go on the cross and Jesus goes on the throne. Fasting breaks the grip of your flesh. So many people are like, man, I'm addicted to pornography. Begin to fast. Oh, you will see that stuff begins to break in your life. Learn to live a life of fasting. Fasting doesn't increase your spiritual worth, but it increases your spiritual weight. You're loved by God whether you fast or not. But you will be treated by the devils differently whether you fast or not. Your spiritual weight changes. Physical weight drops. Spiritual weight increases as you begin to fast. Somebody say bundle of sticks. Somebody say prayer. Somebody say fasting. Now one more. This is the painful one. Financial sacrifice. Financial sacrifice. Now I didn't say tithing because tithing doesn't hurt. For those of you just new believers, it's extremely painful. I'm speaking right now to more of a mature believer. So for those of you who are not believers, you can just blank me out for just next few minutes. I want to speak to the believers. And I learned this the hard way. Please understand the Bible clearly teaches us in Matthew chapter 6. The only competition for your heart is not the devil, sin, generational curses. It's money. Meaning God is not competing with the devil for the allegiance of your heart. He's competing with money. Where the money is, there is your heart, not the other way around. If you want to control your heart, you got to control where your money goes. Something happens with the sacrifice. Sacrifice is when you give something that goes sometimes beyond of what's you're comfortable, led by the Holy Spirit, it begins to break your life. Let me give you a simple example. A pig and a chicken, straight from the kids ministry, were walking and saw a poor farmer, decided to make him a breakfast. So the chicken said, I'll make him an omelet. You pig, give him some bacon. The pig said, well, if you give him an egg, that's an offering for you. If I give him bacon, that's a sacrifice. Many of you always gave God eggs and have never given God bacon. What is bacon? How do you decide bacon? Very simple. It's not what you give. It's what you have left. The poor widow that gave everything, it wasn't the amount she gave. 
it's the amount that was left which was nothing I remember the first time the Lord taught me that three years ago and I was about to get married had a struggle uh, you know kind of couldn't make a decision about marriage and and all of that stuff we were doing a 21 day water fast and and I was I think on the 18th day I just broke up with this girl that I met who is now my wife I broke up with her right before the fast I just had a decision problem making stuff and so during a fast I was reading a book by Francis Chan called Crazy Love not a good book to read when you're fasting because it's going to make you go crazy for Jesus and that's exactly what that book did and next thing that happens is I feel the Holy Spirit convicting me I'm 24 years of age I already have a property I have a nice car and I have all the money saved up in my account for the wedding, the honeymoon, the furniture, the ring, everything. The only problem I have is I can't find a girl that I like and make up my mind to be with. So I go to prayer and fasting and I said, Lord, please send the right person and please make the right person. And the Holy Spirit starts dealing with my heart and He says, you have too much money in your account. And I said, I'm a Dave Ramsey disciple. I do the envelopes. I do the snowball effect. I save that money on the pastor's salary. I was like, I rebuke whatever voice is distracting me and is trying to rob my finances. In the mighty name of Jesus, get out! Because I'm like, God will never ask me to. I'm already giving my tithe like a Pharisee. I ain't giving anything more about that. The next day of fasting, I feel the same thing. And then the Holy Spirit says, why are you so defensive? He says, your heart is attached to that account. I said, God, you don't understand. You don't understand how long it took me to save that money. From 17 years of age till 24, I've been working on that savings account. Because you know how much they, pass, they pay pastors. They keep them poor so you can keep them humble. I say, God, ultimately, it's your fault. I can't marry a girl. Plus, if I marry a Russian one, she has like expensive taste. I don't want her to drop me because I can't buy, for, for, buy furniture and we can't just sleep, sleep on the floor and I'm making all these excuses but see when you're fasting your excuses die out quickly. And then I remember God placed the number. When He placed the number of what I supposed to give. This was not a tithe. This was not an offering. It was bacon. I died million deaths giving that. And when I finally gave that I felt so good until I looked at my account. I felt like I had a mental disorder and I'm like, I'm hearing voices. I'm doing stuff Dave Ramsey would never approve of. I'm losing weight like crazy. I'm going crazy. And honestly, something broke off in the spirit realm in my mind. This girl I broke up with, I reconnect again. God clears something in my mind. We get married. There's enough money for everything and still some $7,000 was left after the wedding. And God changed my life through sacrifice. I want to speak to you right now specifically when pastor was speaking. As a church, I want to challenge you. I have no skin in what I'm about to say except this thing. I have spiritually grown more through what I'm about to say, then through a 40-day water fast, 21-day water fast or any other stuff. And that is this. It's when you put what God puts on your heart at the altar. Now, for some of you, God will never put it on your heart because you shut Him off in that area. You went as far as tithing and after that you have a Jericho wall built that even Holy Spirit cannot penetrate. And this is that wall. All they're after is my money. They're just manipulative pastors. I'm going to tell you something. I've been on a staff at our church for 20 years. Six months ago, I stepped away and started to give my salary away. I give my stuff for free, all of my books. Me and my wife, as of this day, have given, I think, around nine cars. I live what I'm selling. This, I don't do this to boast about it. And I don't do this so that people can give into the ministry. I do this because I've experienced something. Spiritually, you cannot be on fire for God if your roots are too deep in this natural world. I'm not saying you cannot have nice things, but these nice things cannot have you. And that can never happen if you hold all of your possessions, your stock market money, your savings money with a closed fist, having six or seven properties, six or seven cars and say, God, don't you dare to talk to me about those cars. You know how I learned it the hard way? It started, it was with $200. I had a rental property, a duplex, old duplex. Somebody came into my house and gave me $200 to go on the Ukraine trip that I was going for. 
They gave me $200. Somebody else comes into my house that night and I hear the Holy Spirit say, give this $200 to this other person. And I already know how to hear the Holy Spirit in these matters because I know it's not definitely my spirit because I don't want to give them $200. And I know it's not the devil because the devil doesn't love because he gives. The devil doesn't do that stuff. So I knew it was the Lord. And my wife was on board with it which is like another confirmation. But I was like, but they gave me. Not for me to give them. If God wanted to give them, He would just give them. And so I debated it and I talked myself out of it. I said, and giving that is $200. That's a lot of money. Right before I'm leaving to Ukraine, my rental pl place gets a clogged up toilet. So all the sewer stuff in the basement comes up. Nothing new for me. I have a little machine. I go in there, get myself all dirty, smelly. Machine doesn't work. Second day, I hire a company and guess how much they charge me for all of that? $400. And after that was done, I smelled like poop, like sewer and everything. And I came to God right before Ukraine, stressed and all of this stuff. And I felt the Holy Spirit. This was directly to me. I'm not saying this applies to every situation. And He said this, He says, whatever you don't give when I tell you to, my hand of protection is lifted. And he said, lad, remember, the enemy will have access to that which I put my finger on. And after that, I said, Lord, if you protect me from sewers and poop, I will be obedient. <laughs> this is not to threaten anybody or scare anybody, but I do want to remind you, you will not take anything with you to heaven anyway. You, everything will be left on this earth. All of your portfolio, your, your children probably will hire lawyers and fight over it and all of this stuff. You cannot take anything to heaven with you. When me and my wife about eight years ago started to practice radical generosity, it started first with emptying our account completely, then emptying it next year again and emptying it next year again. We did that again six months ago for the building fund where we gave the largest donation our church has ever experienced and it came from its pastors. When we started to experience this, something started to happen to me, Pastor. I started to think about heaven more often. I was scared at first. I was thinking, I'm going to die soon. <laughs> so I said, Jesus, are you preparing me to die? And I remember the Lord responded to me. He said, no. I'm not preparing you to die. He says, it's for the first time in your life, you have more there than here. That's why your heart is thinking about that. Sacrifice is a large log on your fire. I wish I would tell you, come, get filled today, get slain, and you will burn for God forever. That's a spark. It doesn't continue until you put a bundle of sticks. What is the bundle of stick? And sacrifice. As I was speaking, some of you, your hearts start beating faster. And some of you already said, nope, mm -mm, uh -uh, eh -eh. And I asked the Holy Spirit right now that He will help you. Because for some of you, He will give you a number. He will give you something to bring on Sunday for God's house. And some of you, this will be for the first time that you will not just bring God a bigger egg, but you will bring Him bacon. You will weep tears you haven't cried before after that. The intimacy with God will be with you in the way you've never had before. Craving for the eternal, for it's the invisible realm will be different. Why? Because the world will begin to become, lose its appeal. Why? Because your roots are no longer as deep in this world. I know we love to talk about it, but there is really no other experience that can help you with that except the sacrifice. Are you with me? Are you ready for the last thing? And I'm already past my time. The last thing that I want to mention is this. So Paul is building fire. I want you to see this is that he's overcoming the storm, the shipwreck and the rain. Natives kindle the fire. So we mentioned that there are conferences, ministers. God uses people to start that impartation. You get touched by the Holy Spirit. You watch a video, you read a book, whatever that happens. But if you don't have habits, not just high, but habits of prayer and of fasting and of sacrifice that fuels the fire, you are not going to stay on fire for God. 
But as you start building the fire, I want you to notice they didn't just got warm. Watch this. Warfare broke out. Write this down, the third thing, and we're going to be done. And that is this. Fire will provoke vipers, but it will also kill them. Fire will provoke vipers. Now, when people start getting on fire for God, I have to tell you this because sometimes we as pastors don't say this and people get shocked. When you get closer to God, some of you will experience intense warfare. As you start tithing, as you start sacrificing, that's what happened to me. When me and my wife gave our first large sacrifice as a married couple, emptied our account, our rental properties couldn't be rented for six months. And I thought I wasn't hearing God. I went anointed them with oil. I break the, broke the principalities. I, I bound the spirits, renounced the generational curses. I'm like, why is this happening to me? You must understand, it's not that the fire brought the vipers. The vipers were always there. It's just the fire made them uncomfortable. They've always been lurking there. It's just they've been comfortable in your life. But until you started to build fire, hell started to become uncomfortable. They could no longer just live in your life, around your life. They started to become tormented and irritated. And hell rises because it feels threatened by you. Fire did not create the snakes fire exposed the snakes. There are people who get saved and they say my life was bad but it wasn't that bad until I got saved. And when I got saved hell broke loose. I lost my job. I lost my friends. Everybody turned against me. My friend what happened is when you got on fire vipers got nervous. Vipers got exposed. But the most amazing thing that I want to encourage you with today is not that you get them exposed. And maybe some of you say, so what's the benefit of burning for God? The benefit of burning for God is this. Not only that it provokes them, is you have a place to drop the viper into. You can't drop your viper in my fire pit. You have to have your own fire pit. You can't drop what's attacking you on the outside into your pastor's fire. You have to have your own flame to throw it into. And the reason why many people are going from deliverance to deliverance is because they have no fire in their own life. Because to walk in dominion, you have to have a flame to throw the scorpion into. To walk in dominion, you have to have a flame to throw the snake into. You have to have a flame to throw that depression into, that nightmare into, that sexual dream into, that addiction to pornography into. When you build a fire, snakes come out, but you have a place to drop those snakes into. God never created you for deliverance. God created you for dominion. God did not create you to walk and need deliverance. The Bible says in the beginning God said be fruitful and multiply and have dominion. The Bible says through the gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace we reign in life. The reason we need deliverance is because we didn't walk in dominion. Deliverance is a means to an end. The end is, dom is dominion. Deliverance is not the goal. Deliverance is not what you should seek. Victory. Dominion. Discipleship. Deliverance job starts everything. But if you don't have a fire, you won't walk in dominion. If you don't have a fire, you cannot fight back. Because when you get delivered, those demons leave. Three days later they come back on the outside and they start harassing you. Those nightmares will come back on the outside like Pharaoh and say, come back to me. I'm still inside. They will lie to you. And if you don't have a flame, you'll run back to the church and say, pastor, deliver me. But if you have a fire, you say, devil, you tormented me long enough. You tormented my family long enough. I'm against you in Jesus' mighty name. 
I come against you by the blood of Jesus Christ. Get out! Depression, get out! Nightmares, get out! When the devil moves chairs in your room, comes in to intimidate and breaks different things, you tell devil, put it back and get out of this house. This is not your property anymore. But if you're not on fire, you can't fight back. You say, oh, the devil came. I don't know what to do. I'm scared. Oh, somebody cast a spell on me. Pastor, pray for me. That's fine if you are just beginning as a Christian. But I'm speaking to soldiers right now. If you are bitten by a snake right now, if you're tormented by an unclean spirit, if generational curses like vipers stuck their teeth inside of your soul and bleeding the living lights out of you and you feel like you're losing and the voices of the enemy are whispering in one ear and the other and you feel like you are losing right now your spiritual life. You feel like there's an attack on your life. You're losing your spiritual appetite. There's an attack of lack on your life. You, you're feeling drawn away from the church. You don't want to be in a community anymore and you're recognizing as you're listening to me right now, this is more spiritual than natural. I cannot explain this. This is more demonic. If you have fire in your life, all you have to do is shake it off. All you have to do is rebuke it. All you have to do is repent for a sin you did not repent and then right after repentance get up from your knees and say, devil come here. Go! That's it. You say, go, get out. And you get angry at him and you tell him to leave and he will run with the tail between his legs. Why? Because you have the authority and because the fire that exposed him is the fire that will kill him. Amen.